Siri starts peppering him with questions. Didn't more food puns? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Breakfast in Beauclair, a global Witcher podcast. My name is Alyssa from Good Morin, and I'll be your host as you, I, and our international Hansa accompany Geralt of Rivia and his destiny, Cyrilla of Sintra, across the continent. Before we jump into the actual announcements, a quick addendum from the previous episode of the podcast. Anita and Carolina have kindly provided translated excerpts from Historia e Fantastica by Sikovsky and Berez that provide additional context into the worlds of the Witcher and Sikovsky's writing process. This first excerpt relates to our conversations about prophecy in episode 34 and is about Siri and how her character is treated and interpreted by Sikovsky. The thesis, as old as the world, confirms that it is good to read a book to find out about the author's intentions. In the book, however, it is written directly. First, Siri brings a <laughs> thanks to her travels through <laughs> a <laughs> is brought in, the monstrous nature of which can be guessed from the content of the book. Second, it is explicitly stated that the complete destruction of the world of stories is imminent. The cataclysm of glaciation will destroy everything. But it will happen in 3,000 years. Well, the prophecies are twisted, the gods mock people with their help. There are two other excerpts that you guys will hear from Historia e Fantastica throughout this episode, episode 35. For a spoiler version of the excerpt I just read, which relates to the last Witcher novel, Lady of the Lake, visit the spoilers channel in the Hansa Discord. And now to the actual announcements for this episode. I'm so excited to be coming to you today from my brand new sound booth. Huge props to my dad for helping me build it and actually helping me bring it to life. I hope you guys notice a difference in sound. I'm so excited because having this booth and a sound-treated space in my apartment opens up a ton of opportunities for the podcast as well as for other things in the world of audio. So got the sound booth and the other announcement that I have to make to you guys is that I will be in four upcoming audio drama pilots uh, done through an off-Broadway theater here in New York City. I'm incredibly excited to be part of these wonderful casts in four completely different audio dramas. If you've been following along with me, you know that I absolutely fell in love with not just podcasting, but audio fiction and audio as a medium, which is when I also got into voice acting at the end of last year. This is this is about like seven or eight months in the making. And um, when I do get those four pilots, I'll definitely share them with you. And I'm also incredibly proud to be executive producing a new audio fiction show that will hopefully be coming out at the end of this year with voice actors from the community that helps me upgrade my tech, help me upgrade my sound booth to something that is phenomenal. I I can't be more pleased with that group, and I'm so excited to work with them. And I hope that you will tune in later this year for our first audio fiction production. That was a lot of personal stuff, but if you enjoy Breakfast in Beauclair, I really do hope that you'll enjoy my first forays into the world of audio fiction. And of course, all of this would not be possible without our patrons and our produce level patrons. So thank you to our produce level patrons, Louise of Covier, the owner of the Churlish Porpoise, Eric the Godling, Katie the Redhead of Toussaint, Jacob B., Ava of Gullet, B. Haven of the Edge of the World, Charlotte from Megaburg Glamorai, Red Kite, the Original Roach, Ariel Kitty, Dustin, Libby the Castell Ravel Sommelier, Claire O'Dell, Jenna D. Mundilovich, Brett from California, Wolf, Corey from the U.S., and John of Riblia. If you'd like to explore becoming a patron of the show, head over to patreon.com slash breakfast in Beauclair. As for this episode, Anita and Carolina from Witcher Kitchen return for part two of our discussion of Blood of Elves chapter three. Join us as we examine series Witcher training in Kaer Morin, what separates Zakovsky from authors like Tolkien in his own words, language learning, dumpling gate, a new entrepreneurial adventure for the Witchers, Tratitore, Tratitore. 
And this summer, don't miss history's hottest must-have hygiene routine for keeping strigas at bay. In our mid-episode news segment, Tidings from Toussaint, Lars Mutterflix shares casting and production news as production and press mount for season two of Netflix's The Witcher and The Witcher Blood Origin. Without further ado, let's begin our discussion of Blood of Elves, Chapter 3. In the next section, we get a little bit of insight into Ciri's day-to-day life at Kaer Morhen, where she trains with each of the witchers and Triss one-on-one. In her first lesson, Lambert trains Ciri on the comb, and at the end, the girl is revealed to have been blindfolded. I love this scene. This is one of my favorites in this section, just because the reveal of her having a blindfold on after doing all of these flips and somersaults and practicing um, is such a good little touch at the end. I love it. Yes, definitely. It was in the game, so I love it even more. <laughs> because when you just read this part, you think, oh, that's really hard. And then you know that it's more harder because she, she, she didn't see everything. Yes. I think one of the surprising things about Lambert is that he always seems so standoffish. Like, he always feels a little bit sarcastic and a little bit insincere. Yeah. But there's a small moment here where, you know, he obviously cares about her safety, but he has a lot of tough love. Like, there's this quote from it that's really cute where he's shouting at her, don't wobble, lunge, thrust, faster, half beer wet, jump and cut. That's it. Very good. And Siri goes, really? Was, was that really very good, Lambert? <laughs> and he says, who said so? You did a moment ago. Slip of the tongue. And it's it's very sweet. Yes, it's adorable. Even I would say that he's showing his like second side of his character, and that he's quite soft towards her. Yeah. To be honest, like in some cases he's very harsh, but in fact he's very soft, and he teases her. So, and that's. Uh, the second part about this uh, training, about um, sexes. So, like, he doesn't lower the expectations just because of her sex, that she's a girl. And he just trains her like she was a boy, let's say. Like, witches never teach a girl before, right? That's the important thing about that. That it's the same way. So this ties very nicely back to at least the witcher's point of view that Siri can or should be trained um, as equal to the boys. Vesmir had brought up at some point that she was raised in the South where, just like the elves, the girls are raised just the same as boys. Um, so it's interesting to see this come back again here. Yes, especially when we know her background, when she was in fact uh, raised, like in a castle, let's say. So that's changing uh our point of view as well mm-hmm. i don't know about siri but i agree with that what anita said earlier that i think that if we met lambert in something different chapter when he's hunting a monster or something like that or if he met guard in some uh, scene i think uh, we can f- think about this character as unlikely uh, maybe a little not friendly but i think uh, this is a perfect moment when uh, we can as Anita said, meet his uh, different uh, side and it's connected with Siri and uh, this is a perfect uh, for me because it's like he really tries to not uh, give her this feeling that she's a special treatment or something like that but uh, he's also this some kind of brother feelings for her or fatherish like girl I don't know how yes. to say properly but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. They they all have they all have all these fatherish yeah. <laughs> fatherly say, yeah. yeah fatherly uh, feelings towards her and that's really great that even witchers who are perceived as the ones without emotions uh, they still treat her like it's their own let's say daughter. It's very sweet as you said it's so nice we get to see this alternate side of them. Um, We spend so little time with the other witchers in the books, and this, I think, is another indication of how both the reader and how Ciri see them. They're so beloved, and you see this in, like, The Witcher 3, where people love The Witcher Bros, as Brett put it in episode 30. But, yeah, it's just really nice to see, and it gives us a good understanding of um, the fact that Ciri really is being cared for, and uh, she's in an environment where she's being supported and 
challenged at the same time, which I'm sure someone who's about her age really needs. Yes, and especially uh, when Sapkowski did it in a very brief way, because these sections aren't really ro- long. They are not, you know, described for 50 pages. It's just a brief, let's say, um, brief fragment of a training, and it tells us everything about the relations, about the emotions and about mm, their attitude towards each other. Okay, so um, why the some chapters in Sapkowski's books are this uh, short, why some parts are short and not uh, this very big and uh, with many descriptions or something like that, because uh, Mr. Sapkowski has um, always uh, said that it's not like the Tolkien, for example, Tolkien have this many descriptions, all maps and everything, because uh, Tolkien like very play with text in the books. And Sapkowski always said that uh, he don't like the style of writing. He's preferred to write something short, but uh, in very emotional way that uh, when someone read this part, uh, they still feel the mention and how it's important from the uh, later parts of the book, but it's still short, but it's very point uh, to to the point someone who, yeah to the point exactly i always love hearing little tidbits about how sakovsky thinks about his work cuz to me the witcher is quite unique i think he's this kind of writer who don't like to waste his time for some amazing descriptions because i think he may feel that he lose something in this moment when we read uh, something he prefer short uh, ways to express himself in the next little fragment, Triss teaches Siri elder speech and the importance of self-esteem. I think I'm going to say this about all of them. They're all very cute. Triss is trying to teach Siri the elder speech, which is the language of elves. And it's also the language that a lot of magic also uses. Siri's getting kind of bored of what's going on. And she instead asks Triss if they can go sledding. So Triss makes her ask in elder speech. Before they go out, Triss starts to put on makeup which we learn is an elvish invention. And Siri's like, ooh, I want makeup also. So Triss walks her through that. It yields a very nice payoff in the next scene. But for now, uh, yeah, what did you guys think? Uh, first of all, I really like this part about learning languages and the emphasis that it's really important because it's like in our world. Like, if you know languages, you can speak to other people, you can understand their emotions in a different way and it's really nice that even in fantasy worlds like the witcher learning languages is so real (laughs) like it's very uh tough like it could be boring like (laughs) for siri and that tris is saying that if you don't know languages you are some some kind of a cripple so it's really it's really nice um, part of this lesson for me. Yes, I always like this pr- uh, lesson because it some reminds this reminds about a uh, little about me and Anita <laughs> because uh, as you know um, I'm fine with my English like uh, read a book or just watch the movie or something and I'm really not uh, good at uh, to speak with someone. I I mean if I just talk to you like a friend it's fine but. Now we have this podcast and I'm just a little stressed and Anita always encourage me to just go do another step slowly and you can make mm-hmm. it. So I really like this part and I'm always thankful to Anita for <laughs> everything she does for me. As we all do, come on. <laughs> we are all learning. Your English is yes. so much better than my Polish. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I can say but, anything in but Polish. But English is easier, come on. Easier? <laughs> yeah. You guys have sounds that I didn't know existed in Polish. <laughs> yes, that's that's true. Uh, in fact, mm-hmm. Polish is hard even for us, like native speakers. Many of people can't uh, write properly. Even after school, <laughs> even after school, it's really hard because we have this O, which is uh, U, in fact, U. Yeah. And sometimes you write it with an O, sometimes you write it with an open U. It doesn't really change the meaning, in fact. Okay. But sometimes it does. <laughs> so, ah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it does. Sometimes even the grammatical, you know... Uh, może i może. Yes. <laughs> it's so complicated. 
for example, because Alita is perfect with this. It's like this word, uh, morze, uh -huh. and you can write this like to say something about the sea, morze, like, like the sea, yeah. or morze is like maybe. Yes. <laughs> It's the same one. Yes, and one you you write with only Z with uh, with a dot on the top, and the other one you write with R Z. Mm. So <laughs> it's just, it's just crazy. So yes, our our language is really hard, not uh, only in pronunciation but also in grammar and writing. So yes, that's a tricky one. <laughs> So, so I think that English, like the basic English, uh, is really, really easy <laughs> to be honest. So yeah, I yeah. mean the only the only other language that I've been learning. I know that listeners of the podcast know I've been learning Spanish on and off for years, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> still, still going, still go, still inching my way forward. I mean, I spoke to my aunt in Spain maybe a month or two ago mm -hmm. and she was like oh how's your Spanish going and I was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's not going don't <laughs> ask she started chittering at me in Spanish and I started panicking <laughs> oh yes I I learned German for oh me too more than more than more than 12 years yeah and and I'm not really yes and I'm not really using it nowadays so if I encounter something of course I I understand but when I want to speak, the first things that pops into my mind is English. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I'm thinking in English and like, oh my God, how could I say it in German? Mm. I learned that some years ago, but I don't remember anything. So I think it was just a waste of time. But in fact, it's not because if I would go to Berlin uh, for a few days, I, I guess it will just come again to my mind. Because the thing is that we don't hear it like... Um, each day, like you don't hear Polish each day, we hear English everywhere. When we see Netflix, when we uh, read some articles, everything is in English. So it's easier for us to, how to say... Um, like immerse, immerse yourself in it? Yes, yes, immerse ourselves in it. So we are like sponges, you know, who are absorbing all the words and things because they are all around. So it's easier for us, yes. It's uh, the case with all the languages. Of course, English is easier in terms of grammar, in terms of even even writing, I guess. It's easier than Polish, but still, it's easier to learn when you hear it and see it everywhere. I've been thinking about this for a while, um, making language channels in the Hansa Discord so people can speak to each other in whatever language they want or practice different languages. I know there are quite a number of people in our community who are busy learning languages so maybe maybe i'll do that around the time this episode comes out or something <laughs> yeah <sighs> but come on learning languages is fun yeah even if it's really tough tricky and sometimes boring <laughs> <laughs> it's still great to be honest like the in like the whole experience mm -hmm. and it's so rewarding too definitely um, what I can say about this part of the book, uh, I think... Yeah, is... get us back on track, Carolina. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> no, I just remember that why this part about language is so important. I just think, oh, yeah, again, about Sapkowski's life, because, yeah, as you uh, may know that from Around the Table series that you made, yes. that we have this information about his... Uh, I don't know how it's in English that he was this... Przedstawiciel Handlowy. Mm. Like the sales representative? Ah, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, so he's traveled a lot and he uh, also uh, he's own learned uh, uh, many languages. I remember he learned Russia, English. He allegedly knows Italian, but that's a whole separate story. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is something about his life again and again because uh, language uh, is important in his life and... Uh, I think uh, now he wants to just take uh, to touch about this part in this book. And also I remember that he complains a little bit about the translation of his book, that it's German or Spanish, uh, that the translation of The Witcher is not the perfect. <laughs> when they translate his book, uh, they really try, do their best, but uh, he admits that uh, little parts uh, are changed or something because there is no a good translation for Polish to like Spanish or German for this part. Yeah, 
A couple quick stories. Well, to back up to uh, Carolina's note about the Around the Table series, you can find that on the Breakfast in Claire YouTube page. I believe the fact that you're referencing was that Sikofsky was a traveling salesman mm-hmm. of some sort, and I believe he found himself in a store where all of the product names were girls' names, and one of them was Cirilla. Yeah. <laughs> Name of jacket. <laughs> but it's, I mean, you get inspiration from anywhere as an author, I suppose. The other thing was when Lars and I had gone to Luca around Halloween 2019, we saw Sikofsky give a Q&A. The translation was one of the things that he brought up. And he kept shouting in Italian um, that the translator is a traitor. <laughs> I, I don't know the actual words because I don't speak Italian, but it was like, trattatore to something. And like he kept <laughs> shouting it. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I was wondering, you requested your books to be translated from Polish into well, Italian, English, whatever, without using any other language as intermediate. So how come did you ask this? And have you ever been involved in the translation process? Or did the translators ask you questions about how to translate some specific words? <laughs> you know, there is an Italian saying about traditore traduttore. <laughs> so the translator is a traitor. And it's true. Mostly he's a traitor. What can I do? Uh, nobody asks me about the translation. Or even very but what can I do? Oh my God, with Korean, Finnish, Hungarian, Lithuanian, I can do something with Italian, I can do something with French, I can do something with uh, Russian, but sorry, nothing with Hungarian, nothing. So they, oh, of course, they present me the translation. They say, what do you think about it? What can I think about it? Hungarian? <laughs> nothing. Korea, Japanese, Chinese, nothing. I can only look at it, only look at it. What can I do? Nothing. So I am in the hands, I am in the hands of the translator. And Traditore, traditore. <laughs> but in fact, as we said, even in English, uh, you cannot, you just cannot do it yeah. because you don't have these words. Like even swearing in Polish, it's so characteristic. It's uh, oh, yeah. you cannot, you cannot just uh, make up the word in English, which could be the exact one for this. So. It's so original, like original wording in Polish. So if you do the translation, it's just, let's say, it's flattened. Like it's not maybe worse, but it's flattened when it comes to understanding and the beauty of the language, even if it's uh, the swearing. (laughs) Yeah, I know that the last time that you guys were on the podcast, we had talked about Yarpin's. A uh, little, yes. oh, <laughs> the Arpen's yes. performance in the bounds of reason, and you guys were educating me on all of the lovely Polish swearing that you guys have. <laughs> yes, yes, we have a lot to be honest. <laughs> so, getting back to Tris's lesson, um, <laughs> after she teaches Siri about the language, yeah, she teaches her about beauty. Did you guys have any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, uh, in fact, it's the empowerment of women uh, in The Witcher, I guess. <laughs> it's again the topic of making them stronger than uh, usually, uh, let's say, we think about women, mm, maybe about stereotypes. And here Tris says that she is just making makeup for herself so she can feel better for herself. And it's a really unusual attitude. It's really unusual, let's say, if you say it out loud. Everything you do, even if you look nice, it's not for the others, it's for you. So you can feel better, you can, you know, raise your self-esteem. Uh, I've never encountered anything, uh, anything... Um, oh God, I forgot the word. 
Tell me. Now you are me. P- p- <laughs> Podobne. Uh, anything similar in the books uh, before, mm. like this mention. So I think it's really nice. We see it, let, let's say, as women as well. So we have a different attitude <laughs> towards it. So yeah. For us, it's even even more important, let's say. If we see that s- the writer is mentioning something important for us, like as women. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. I think uh, it's very surprising for women when we read Sapkowski that he created these characters uh, that is not to be the classic uh, lady who needs a man who saved them, but uh, he creates characters that are very strong. And when I read uh, something like these parts, I think uh, he writes this for me when some girl... Uh, read this part of the books, feel good, feel confident. He don't want that we expected uh, something bad in this character and his creation, but uh, he break the stereotypes and he said, yes, you should be proud for yourself, do this for yourself. And uh, and you see that uh, these characters in the books, like uh, Therese or Yennefer and Ciri, could be... Uh, some kind of role model for you that you should be strong and take whatever you want. Hey guys, if you skipped over the intro at the top of the episode, Anita and Carolina have kindly provided translated excerpts from Historia e Fantastica by Sikovsky and Berez that provide additional context into the worlds of The Witcher and Sikovsky's writing process. Here's the second excerpt about which Anita and Carolina said... After analyzing the fragment about the prophecy, Ciri's character is not fully determined as the author treats her as a white or blank page which can be written upon. This fragment is about transformation and reads, Ciri, on the other hand, is gray, unremarkable, yet undefined. She whitens in the finale. You could say, just a bit like Gandalf. Gandalf from gray becomes white because he goes through the rite of passage. Ciri, at the end of the story, is a blank card that can be written down. As to with what and how this page will be written, I leave the reader in the dark to make him wonder. And when Sapkowski creates these characters uh, for our woman, and also they are very strong, is something wow for me. Like, yeah. yeah. And I do think that, you know, as a global society, there's a lot more, you know, awareness and an interest in um, creating a generation of girls that is more confident, that does have the ability to pursue whatever they want to. I think the the times are certainly changing. And I guess we'll talk about that in the next section as well. <laughs> but, you know, it's nice to see that immortalized here in Triss's lesson, that the beauty that Siri pursues should be done for her and her alone. I think that's a really lovely message to give to readers of this book, no matter what gender they are. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and exactly this chapter is actually quite fun between... Uh, what Ciri can do because in one side we have this uh, witcher staff and she must uh, be treated like the boy that uh, and in another side we have this softly side uh, with trees when we have this little more girl part and it's very well mixed I think yes that we have uh, something from both sides let's say that uh, we can do things that could be you know in earlier times just for men and one hour later, you just do some makeup and feel very uh, self-confident about it because you're doing it for yourself. So we're just switching uh, duties so you can just train and then do the makeup. So it's mm-hmm. so it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I think brings us to Vesemir's lesson, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is so silly. You know, in this section, Vesemir quizzes Siri on her knowledge of monsters and teaches her about the relationship between knowledge and fear. This is a very interesting, you know, memorization theoretical lesson about monsters. But when it first starts out, Vesemir interrupts himself and says, hey, look at me. What the devil have you got in your eyelids? And Siri just responds, greater (laughs) (laughs) self-esteem. Yes, that that was a nice pun. (laughs) It's just very wholesome. This whole chapter, it humanizes the witchers so well, and it really builds the foundations of Ciri's confidence, her understanding, her learnings that are going to take her through the rest of the series for sure. Um, But what were your thoughts about Vesemir's lesson? Mm. Karina, maybe you could tell us about about ghouls. Yeah, yeah, I know. (laughs) 
and this part I just tell you about two things. The first thing is, of course, that many creatures uh, in the creature books are inspired by some real monsters and legends in uh, Europe or in different parts of the world. And, for example, as this monster is uh, inspired by uh, Arabian uh, legends. It's funny because in Poland we have this book like Manuscript Discovered in the Dragon Cave. I tell about this book uh, Ariel. And uh, actually uh, Mr. Sapkowski creates some kind of the list of the monsters and we can learn how uh, he know about them and why he put in, in the Witcher books. But it's only a smart part. Not every monsters are in this book. But uh, what is um, funny for me that in this chapter we learn about how to defeat monsters. Yeah, we think about the silver sword and uh, everything uh, connected with the witchers. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, when I talk to Anita about uh, this chapter and what we can say to you, I told her about this funny part that everybody thinks about the witcher and nobody thinks what actually normal people can do to defeat from the monsters <laughs> and I don't have about ghoul and uh, I want to tell something about Striga. Yes, we know Striga from this uh, previous part uh, in the first uh, book and for example, if you're not a witcher, uh, you're a normal person living in someone on the continent and you want to protect uh, your family, uh, your children, etc. Uh, now I can give you a small tip. These tips are very funny for me, but uh, we can learn about them in some old uh, books. You can find them in best story uh, in Polish, in German, and etc. This is just like a book about this old folklore in every country in Europe. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you are terrorized about Stry about Striga. What you can do to protect from this monster, you couldn't pour your water from the bath uh, after sunset. And for example, don't wash uh, your children on Friday. <laughs> yeah, so um, then Striga won't come and attack. And I know this is not very helpful for the princess who turned into Striga, but yeah. maybe <laughs> it would be a good idea to protect for residents for Vizima, for example, if they could follow the buff rules instead of getting held the witcher, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what they needed was to bathe less. <laughs> yeah, and maybe maybe witchers must, I don't know, publish some book about what you can do as a normal person to protect them. <laughs> and then they will be poor and starve to death because, well, they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they wouldn't earn any money. But they can have profits for selling the book. Yeah. Uh, yes, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know that the uh, money for killing the monster is very low in the book and they complain about this. So, you know, maybe printing is better. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, don't wash the children on Friday. Even if they're uh, full in mud or something, don't wash them. I wonder why Friday? Like, what is so special about Friday that that is the day to not wash your kid? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes we have some superstitions, uh, especially in Poland, uh, from some old times. I don't know where they came from. And sometimes they're so silly. Yes. I can't even... Like, you cannot stitch or use your needle for example if you have a hole in your trousers or in your t-shirt you shouldn't do it on sunday yeah or... <laughs> do you know the reason no no no, no i don't know but it's some old uh, i don't know superstition yes because we have the superstition some of them are uh, still alive in our culture and uh, some uh, are dead or something, and it's a great uh, folklore books that yes. you can uh, buy and read, and it's more silly things inside. Yes, <laughs> and they are very from region to region. Sometimes yeah, exactly. they're yeah. Sometimes they're like in the whole Poland. Sometimes they're just for for the region. So sometimes if you if we meet someone from another region, they are telling us something, and I just what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> This is funny, and actually, I must say that when uh, the Witcher books came and next the series and the game, it's uh, this part of our folklore is now more alive in Poland, I think. And now we have this great some books about folklores, monsters, and some 
uh, rituals yes. and I think it's very cool because this part of our um, it's our heritage yeah exactly and uh, now we can learn more about this because people are more interested about it because now they can see this part in the witcher who is now popular <laughs> mm -hmm. and you guys also had a note here about i guess sakovsky had written a book called manuscript discovered in a dragon's cave did you want to talk about that as well so, Manuscript Discover in the Dragon's Cave is a compendium about uh, knowledge of fantasy books. Uh, and uh, actually, we have some chapters. Uh, one chapter is about the monsters. Uh, where, and I said this about uh, how uh, you can find in this chapter some interesting facts about uh, monsters that you can actually uh, find in the Witcher books. Another chapter is about his inspiration, about uh, his work and what books he recommended to read. Another chapter is about just history on fantasy. I don't want to say uh, like encyclopedia book. <laughs> it's more like just a nice uh, message to fans. And I think this book is very good uh, if you don't know much about fantasy especially this kind uh, you can find in the Witcher world. And when you read this uh, manuscript discovered in the Dragon's Cave, maybe you want to read some another books uh, or something uh, different text. And everything is recommended by Mr. Sapkowski. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check it out. I actually haven't heard of this book, so I wanted to make sure I brought it up in the podcast by name. I don't know it's translated, yeah. <laughs> I hope. I was just about to say, if I am able to find a English translation of it, I'll put a link in the show notes if you go to breakfastmclaire.com. If I find it, I'll put it there for you all. One of the last things about this section is that we learn that Siri still has stress and trauma from her time on the run after she left Sintra. And she's really triggered by the images of the necrophages and memories of Sodden and Transriver, which causes Vesmir to say to her, when you know about something, it stops being a nightmare. When you know how to fight something, it stops being so threatening, which I think is a very beautiful line from this section as well. It's the total essence of uh, fighting uh, everything, in fact, in our real life as well. So it's not only about monsters so we can also take it to our lives and just learn from it not every monster is a monster like it's something traumatic for your life uh, something you experience and this line suits to every moment i think yeah i think there's certainly a time and a place where every single witcher character explicitly conquers one of their fears same thing with siri there are moments throughout the series that are very transformative for her and as you guys said, it boils down to this idea of being able to conquer those fears with knowledge, really, and execution. Yeah. Before we continue with the episode, we're going to hand it over to Larson Witcherflix for recent news on the Netflix show. When we come back, Anita, Carolina, and I will continue our discussion of Blood of Elves Chapter 3. Hey, it's Lars from Witch of Licks, and this is Tidings from Toussaint. Welcome back, everybody. We're still desperately waiting for something new about Season 2 of The Witcher. And it seems like our cries have been heard. Netflix announced some big Witcher news coming in the week from June 7th to June 11th. They write that they will be live on Netflix Geeked, with big news, exciting first looks and more from the shows and films you love. They tease that The Witcher will be among these shows. But whether this announcement will be about a teaser, a trailer, some new character or set photos, or even a release date, remains to be seen. But for now, let's see what happened in the Netflix Witcher world in the past weeks. First, Witcher showrunner Lauren Hisrick posted on Twitter that she was back in London and confirmed that the post-production for season 2 of The Witcher is well on its way. Moreover, in another post, she added that she is already doing press work for season 2. So, could an interview be part of Netflix Geek's week? Possible but I don't think this is the only option. Interviews and other promotional stuff will pop up in different places very soon. In other news, Witcher writer Matthew D'Ambrosio teased his episode in season 2 on Twitter, or at least the feel we can expect in it. He said, 
I won't say what my season 2 episode of The Witcher is about, but I will say that I exclusively listened to Godspeed You Black Emperor's album Luciferian Towers the entire time I was writing. The experimental post-rock band from Quebec is known for its drowning, epic and often dark music. In the world of The Witcher prequel spin of Blood Origin, there was definitely even more to report. According to Redanian Intelligence, filming for the spin-off is set to begin this August, with an end in November 2021. They add that the show will probably have two directors, Sarah O'Gorman, who also worked on season 2 of the main show, and Vicky Jusen. Moreover, Sophia Holland Casting released another casting call for a female character named Kali. It is for an actress of East Asian descent. It reads as follows. A sweet and enthusiastic handmaid to a member of royalty and the young wife of a sought-after genius. Eager, kind, caring and loyal to her husband and his plight. In addition, Redanian Intelligence reports that a very surprising character will appear in Blood Origin. It is Aradine, the commander of the Wild Hunt. He is supposed to be played by Australian actor Jacob Collins Levy, known for TV shows such as The White Princess or Young Valander. This is very interesting as Aradine and his Wild Hunt had been confirmed to appear in The Witcher main show too. There, Aradine will be played by Sam Hazeldine. We don't know if Sam Hazeldine will play an older version of Jacob Collins Levis Aradine or if the main show's Aradine will only appear in a brief cameo role. It seems like Aradine will be a fully fleshed out character in Blood Origin. Anyway guys, that's all for today. I hope you all stay safe and well. We we'll talk again in the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair. Until then, thanks again for listening and good luck on the path. Hey everyone, welcome back from the break. When we left off, we discussed series lessons with Lambert, Triss, and Vesemir. In Cohen's lesson, Cohen teaches Siri about advantages in fencing and sword fighting, answering the girls' questions along the way. I love this scene um, because he seems so boyish and delightful and is not at all, um, he isn't really afraid to show her affection and he's very open about it. Cohen for me is like the youngest brother for the whole Witcher family and treats Siri more like younger sister or something like that, yeah. It feels like a continuation of her lesson with Lambert. Cohen is specifically teaching her how to sword fight and, you know, Siri kind of complains. She's like, this isn't fair. You're big. I'm small. Cohen teaches her how to use her natural abilities and her natural qualities to her advantage. Cohen says, you know, there's no such thing as a fair fight. You have to make use of every advantage and opportunity that you can get. And this is something that, again, she'll continue to use this lesson throughout the series. When you look at these lessons, Cohen, um, Lambert, and Geralt, of course, you can see that uh, they always the same topic about her ability to do something. And she said that she cannot do this. And they always tell her that... Uh, she shouldn't give up. Um, she just should look at uh, some situation in different point of view. I mean, Lambert uh, give, as we said earlier, we give her this advice and uh, that she do something right. Now, uh, Cohen say that uh, she shouldn't expect it the fair fight. And next we have Geralt who tell her that uh, it's not important that she's girl or boy. You can do something in different way, but very important is the ending when she win. But in how she win doesn't matter. And uh, every witcher give her lesson from different point of view, but it's about the same. I think that uh, she shouldn't thinking about she can do something because she's weaker, smaller, or something like that. She's girl, but um, she should uh, take from the situation and create her own way to do something because in the end all that matters is how she gets to this point and not that she do this in boy style or something like that. I think you summed it up really well. These lessons aren't just about techniques and it's not just about the knowledge that she's gaining about monsters. It really is about teaching her how to think. So the way that she should think in a fight, the way that she should outwit an opponent, not just with strength, but with cleverness and with dexterity. We get all of that from Lambert, from Cohen, and from Geralt, which makes it you know, so exciting to see it pay off later down the line. The third and final excerpt from Anita and Carolina is about series fencing training. Sikovsky explains why she practices it as she could have been raised by the witchers differently. He describes the system of character building and what path it should take. 
for Ciri's character, it was natural to learn fencing. It is obvious that keeping the archetypical narrative and meeting the requirements of popular literature and fantasy novels are completely immersed in it, it was necessary to show the science of fencing, which is a very important element of the rite of passage that the protagonist goes through. As with Ursula de Guin, we educate a magician. The topic of training a warrior, or rather a female warrior, must have appeared here, because Ciri, not a witcher, goes through training in the novels. Okay, so, so we can just uh, go uh, further, I guess, and then we will just get into this foodie part. Yeah, let's talk about food. You're waiting for this, right? <laughs> it's your time to shine, Anita. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm always talking about that. Come on. <laughs> Give me a break. You want to change? For, you can now tell about Wild Hunt if you want. No, no, thank you. That's your part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so there's some part uh, in this training where... Uh, uh, Siri is uh, saying, I'm not tired, I'm hungry. And Cohen is saying, bloody hell, so am I. And today is Lambert's turn, and he can't cook anything other than noodles. If he could only cook those properly. So now we know that Lambert is not really a good cook. And um, it's the one of characteristics uh, of uh, the characters in Sapkowski's books that even their cooking skills can be their their traits. So they even described in such terms, let's say. For me, it's really cool. And uh, here we have uh, next, um, let's say, next issue about translating. Because in Polish, it's Kluski, right, Karolina? Check it out, because here we have noodles. But if I'm not wrong, we can also say it could be dumplings. And I remember that somewhere I saw it was translated as dumplings, because Alisa, uh, once uh, during the Hansa right, uh, meeting, we said about these translations. And I'm not sure you have the British one or American one, and they are differ. Uh, in some wordings. Yeah, it's, it's noodles in my translation. And I'm not sure if everywhere it's noodles or there's also dumplings instead of noodles. Uh, I just found this part and it's kluski. Oh yeah, so I was right. So kluski is more like dumplings. I said it to you before. In fact, in Polish one, we have kluski, which is more like a dumpling. Of course, it could be noodles because still we are uh, calling kluski like pasta. But if we are thinking about witchers, I don't think they were doing pasta in Kermoren. I would rather go for something dumplingly, like cylinder shaped or oval shaped, flour based or even potato based uh, dumplings. Like without filling, just the chunks of a dough which is boiled in the water with salt and then just served with onion, with some mushrooms, with some herbs and everything you have at your hand. It's a rustic. Yes, it's very rustic, I would say. And this mention is very, very nice, as I said, because uh, it gives some culinary skills for one of the character. And we know that witchers have their weak points. <laughs> And in this case, it's cooking, for example. And they like to eat something good, like we all do, right? We don't want to eat just because it's our duty. We want to eat because it's very pleasant when you can eat something good, so very tasty. We have many mentions about food in the Witcher books. We think it's also because uh, Sapkowski himself, he, he likes to cook. He likes to spend time in the kitchen. So I think we can understand why there are so many mentions about the food, why they're so descriptive, why they're so they're so tasty for your imaginations. Uh, when sometimes uh, there are few mentions, especially in the season of storms, when you, when Geralt enters the tavern. I don't want to spoil anything here, but there are a lot of dishes mentioned there, and you can just get hungry uh, by just reading this. So <laughs> yes, and I really love it about these books that they touch this humanly side of life like eating is very important for us is important for people in the books in fantasy books and even for the witchers so it's really nice yes 
Yeah, because he could write something about, oh, it's a meat on the table, and that's all. And uh, as Anita said, it's uh, very great descriptions about very good food. But I don't know. I don't... Maybe I will try something, <laughs> everything. Yes. It's, it's, it's still brief, uh, but it's to the point. So so that's that's uh, really good about that. And you can say, Anita, about this, that uh, for us it's very unusual because as we discuss, uh, some chapters are very short, some parts are very short, but in this condensed text, he still has time to write about food. Yeah, <laughs> yes. which I know you guys love. <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course, <laughs> we do. <laughs> Every mention is our precious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to the rest of Cohen's Lesson with uh, Siri, there was one thing that I really loved, and it's the closing here. After they, you know, sit down, finish their lesson, chat about Lambert, Siri starts peppering him with questions. Uh, so Siri asks him, who's the best fencer in the world? And Cohen says, I've no idea. You've never known one? I've known many who believed themselves to be the best. Oh, what were they? What were their names? What could they do? Hold on, hold on, girl. I haven't got an answer to those questions. Is it all that important? Of course it's important. I'd like to know who these fencers are and where they are. Where they are? I know that. Ah, so where? In cemeteries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lovely. It's so, it's just so clever. Like, I think the writing and you know, the character study between not just Siri and Cohen, but all of these little character studies um, are just so playful. I think given where we are in the series right now, where it's a very nurturing environment and uh, we're learning just enough about the characters for them to feel real, um, which I think is very nice. Yes, they're definitely feeling real for the reader. Uh, at least for me, it was always like that. Like, they have these traits which are very human, which are very uh, real. So they're not, you know, almighty heroes uh, that they're just thinking about fighting and there's no threat for them. Even when they're, you know, f uh, facing monsters and so on, they're still very human in their attitude toward the world, toward death, toward fighting, toward emotions. So, yeah. So, yeah, this is a funny part because... Yeah, uh, he met uh, people who think they are the best and uh, he's still alive and they are of graveyard. <laughs> and it's also uh, some kind of humor in Sapkowski's book. I don't want to say harsh, but... It's dark humor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's dark humor. <laughs> it says so much about, I guess, like, this is the world. That's the way that it is. Everyone who's great ends up dead. It is dark humor, um, but it casually tells the reader what the realities of living on the continent could be in a very succinct and uh, clever and funny way. Yes, everything in one. Mm -hmm. Yes, on <laughs> one side we have Dandelion and his point of view about the world. It's everything is fantastic and lovely. And we have this Witcher point of view, which is dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know what, when you just read a book and we have just Geralt and Yaska, just like two worlds in one. <laughs> I, I do not think that, like, Twitter and the greater internet would mind if it was just a Geralt and Yaskier book. <laughs> yeah. So the last lesson that we get here is with Geralt. And Geralt coaches Siri through a difficult challenge on the pendulum and teaches her how to approach problems in unexpected ways. Geralt is teaching Siri how to basically dodge and attack at the same time with a series of pendulums and then as a third to make it more challenging for her. You know, she goes through this a number of times, gets incredibly frustrated about the whole exercise, and she's like, but I have to dodge these and attack the sack. Geralt shows her a new way of looking at the problem in which, instead of purely dodging the pendulums, she uses it as an impetus to carry her through the rest of the movement and pushes herself off of the pendulums. New way of looking at something, as we had said, Lambert, Cohen, and Geralt all teach her about new ways of approaching different kinds of problems, and this section is no different. Yes, and it's all about uh, like seeking advantages of your own traits, of your own body, of your own minds, than, you know, complaining about everything you have or you don't have. It's a very good direction uh, for, for Siri. It's a very good teaching for her, especially when we know how the story unfolds in the, uh, in the later books. And I think Geralt's lesson is the most straightforward, but we also get so much time between him and Siri. But it is always nice to see him parent her. And, you know, this is no exception. Do you guys have 
Any final thoughts on, I guess, these few lessons and their place in the story? Uh, as we said earlier, in fact, uh, it's just the essence of, uh, you know, the very specific kind of a family who uh, cares about Siri, but also cares in a way that uh, she must protect herself. The family that it's preparing her for her future because they know they can't always be around her. And that's a very good thing about this, that they know that many things could happen in the future, so she should be prepared for them. She should be self-confident and she should just look for the advantages, not to, you know, be always depressed about what she doesn't have or what she can't do, but instead seeking for solutions in every situation and for thinking in her own way. And for me is this lovely part in this chapter when uh, Ciri uh, wants to learn everything about fight because she wants to kill this uh, uh, knight from Sintra and Geralt tell her that they don't learn her to kill people, to revenge, they learn her to protect herself and other people who but can't. It's, but it's at the end, I guess. Oh, wow, but, but we are in the end. No, it's we have current events to discuss still. But I think this the end is a political about trees and girls. Yes, but we have it. The, the oh. sentence you mentioned at the end. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? so just... just I need to finish and okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, we can just go to the current events and Tris updates on the world, I guess. Before we get to those current events and updates, we're going to end our discussion here. Join Anita and Carolina from Witcher Kitchen and I in the next episode of Breakfast in Beauclair for our continued discussion of Andrew Sikowski's Blood of Elves, Chapter 3. Thanks for joining us at the Breakfast Table. For show notes, transcripts, and each episode, and complete list of our social platforms and listening services, head over to breakfastandbeauclair.com. Breakfast and Beauclair is created by Alyssa from Good Morning. It's hosted by Alyssa of the Times Bridge Sound News, by Alyssa Mitchell Flicks. The show is edited by Alyssa of Music by Major Filter Media. Breakfast and Beauclair is produced by Alyssa in New York City with Louise of Covia, the owner of the Trillish Porpoise, Eric Sagothin, Katie the Redhead of Dissant, Jacob B. Ava of Gallup Behaven of the Edge of the World Shot, Mega Bar Glamour, Red Kite, the original merch, Ayla Kitty, Dustin Libby, Clara Delja, and Neiman Dilovich, Brad from California, Wolf Corey from the US, and John of Roblia. Special thanks to Anita and Carolina for joining us for this episode and our international Hansa for their support.